Welcome to Wednesday afternoon Bible class. We have had a little gap in time, so it is, oh my goodness, August 31st, and we are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 9. Uh, technically, we're going to just look at uh, 17 in general, not in any real depth at all, and then we'll start new and fresh from 18 forward. Uh, but if you're looking for the continuity via date, realize a couple of the dates are missing, but we're glad to be back together. And uh, the last time we were together, we had a wonderful study on the rainbow in its depth. And uh, because of that, like I say, all I'm going to say from our verse 17, this is the sign of the covenant which I've established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. I think that includes you as well as me today. Are we not flesh? So we know God has still has a covenant with us. And really, when we see that rainbow, we see the joint product of the storm and the sunshine. It's a type of God's meeting ground. It's like his mercy seat between sinful man and holy God. The storm is speaking of the judgment uh, on sin and the sunshine, S-O-N, bringing us the rainbow of mercy and grace. Remember, we looked at it as redemption's arch in never-ending blessings of wonder. And we had other acronyms and all that, but I'll let you look up the lesson that was previous. And forgive me while I catch my breath. <laughs> um, by the way, remember also, son of righteousness, spelled S-U-N, is in Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 that we see it definitely speaks of Messiah. So he is the embodiment of the rainbow. It really is his signature. It's around his head. It's around his throne. It comes out, um, I believe, reflected in the crystal sea throughout all of heaven. We see it miraculously brought to us on earth, the flesh, a sign as God smiling down at us because the bow has no arrow anymore. The arrow has been sent. It has pierced, and there has been the resurrection and the glory, and that's what we're in is the glory. As we move forward in verse 18, here is where I'm going to derail us just for a moment because we're going to read just a little bit more about Noah. We're going to see who comes off the ark. In fact, I can read that part. No, I think I'll stop here. I already said that I think I'll just stay right here. We're only going to get one more story about Noah, and then we're going to have to say goodbye to him and move on to those who come on the scene after him. And before we leave him, I want us to look one more time, one more angle uh, at him. We know that it was said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that Noah was seen in God's grace as a righteous man. He was the one who was faithful, who listened to God, who was obedient to God, who built an ark because the rain was coming when they had never seen rain before. I should say the flood was coming, and yet they'd never even seen rain before. But in his faithfulness, he believed his God. He preached it. He preached it over a 100 years. He preached it with no living results that we know of. We know that it came down to just his family. And his family went on the ark safely with him. But before we go into what happened after the ark, coming out of the ark, I just want to do a quick comparison with you between Noah and Yeshua, Jesus, because we can see such similarity. Um, Noah in scripture is said that he had an outstanding character. He's listed with the likes of Daniel, Daniel, and Yov, Job, in the hall of faith. And if you don't know where the hall of faith is, that's Hebrews chapter 11. I'll let you read that on your own. But Hezekiel, Ezekiel 14, calls it righteous company. I think that's a good way to put it, that in, in the family of those who are righteous, in, in our God who has made them righteous. Now, Noah is best known for floating, not sinking. Okay, <laughs> he's best known for floating, not sinking, with the greatest challenge of his life even. And this isn't just a boat story, and it isn't the one that gets bigger and bigger, but we learn that in this we see the promise of Messiah. We see that the, that's the most important issue from Adam all the way to us today. It's always all about Yeshua, about our Messiah, Mashiach. We know all of our scriptures really are his story in relation to him. So how does Noah portray the Messiah to us? Well, let's start at the beginning. 
a very good place to start, is it not? <laughs> and when we go to the beginning, we realize that a baby's been born. His name is Noah. The Hebrew meaning of his name was that there would be comfort brought to the people at this time, or on this earth, I should say. I'll do that just a bit more and it's just a bit better. But right now, we're told he's the son of Lamech. Right from the beginning, we're going to see these names are meaning something. So if I take the name Noah, and I tell you that the root of his name in the Hebrew is Nacham, and Nacham is comfort. Those of you with me in Shabbats right now know we're in seven Shabbats of comfort, building up to the high holy days. And here is a reminder that his name, his life somehow is going to be a picture of comfort. And then when he's the son of Lamech, Lamech means powerful one. So it's the comfort of the one who comes from the powerful one. We know God the Father is the powerful one, not that, that Yeshua is not. He is equal, so he is just as powerful. But in looking at the names, we're seeing that the Father who sent the, or who um, has the Son, and I put it that way because even Yeshua is called the only begotten Son of the Father. We know it's not a natural birth, but it's a relation that's being talked about. So the powerful one is sending comfort. Yehovah, when he brings Yeshua in human form, is bringing comfort to the earth. That foreshadowing that we're seeing in the name comfort, also in that root, we have compassion, and we have the idea of rest from work. Now, Noah's father regarded Noah as a deliverer, that he would comfort man from the curse on the earth. Remember, the earth has been cursed because Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, the curse fell on, the judgment fell on earth also. And of Yeshua, it was also prophesied that he would bring rest to the people. He would bring comfort to the people. Genesis 5.29, by the way, for those who want to go back to that reference, is where he's named Noah and that he will comfort us in our labor, in the hard work we do with our hands to get what we do from the ground that Adonai, the Lord, has cursed. Then for Yeshua, we see Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah 11.10. Then in the day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. The root of Jesse is Yeshua. Jesse was father of David. David is the ancestor of Yeshua. So we know the reference when Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus is called son of David. Here's the relation now to the root of Jesse. And this one in Isaiah 11.10 says, In that day, the nations who resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. So Israel is being promised there's a day coming when this one is going to bring a resting place, a comfort to, to the nations of the world through Israel, and it is glorious, and actually through the land of Israel, I mean, because it's when promised Messiah is sitting on his throne on earth. So there'll be comfort. We know it'll be a thousand years of shalom, of peace on the earth. But we also see, before that time comes, that Yeshua said uh, in Matthew 11 and verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Yeshua himself claiming individual rest for all who come to him and world rest when, when Messiah is sitting on the throne in Yerushalayim. So um, we see the relation there. We see Noah was to be a comfort. It was to be rest for the, the people. And we see that with Yeshua also. In our Hebrew, the Hebrew word for rest is also the idea of relief. And does not this promised rest bring us relief? The greatest rest we know is in Yeshua. When we stop on our Shabbat, it's to be a time of rest. In biblical times, in the Shabbat, when God gave it to mankind in the very beginning, it was to remind them he was their creator and he created the world for them, and then God rested. We know he didn't rest because he was tired, but he gave to the people a 24-hour period of time to just stop. Stop working. Stop the effort. Stop trying to get what you need. Stop trying to do your own things. Just stop. Just rest. Just focus 
on God, on the gift of salvation, on the gift of rest, on the gift of comfort, on the gift of shalom. And trust me, if you spend a 24-hour period of time, you are refreshed and you are ready for your work week and to move on. We grow weary when we do not stop and rest in our God, the one who brings comfort. So very much Yeshua brought the promised rest that the Shabbat pictures, but he also brought the greater rest, and we know that's the rest from the curse. The land being cursed, and Noah was to bring comfort to, to the land, and we know it gets a fresh start. And when you come into the sun, you come into a fresh start, and you're released from the curse, the curse of sin. Now, Lamech also commented that he believed his son, Noah, would deliver them from those effects of the curse, and that was what was prophesied of Messiah. Yeshua did just that, Galatians 3.13. The Messiah redeemed us from the curse pronounced in the Torah by becoming cursed on our behalf, for the Tanakh says, everyone who hangs from a stake or everyone who hangs on a tree comes under a curse. So we know that when Messiah hung on the cross, he was becoming taking on him the curse of sin for all of mankind to bring us that comfort, that rest, that relief. So the names fit very well. We see it. We know that Messiah's sacrifice on, you call it Mount Calvary, it's on Golgotha, it's on Mount Moriah, the same place where Avraham offered up Yitzhak, not exactly the same location, but on that mountain range. We know the curse was broken over all mankind to bring rest and relief, to bring compassion and comfort. And we read that also in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For just as in connection with Adam, all die, so in connection with Messiah, all will be made alive. Same chapter, 15, verse 45. In fact, the Tanakh says, So Adam, the first man, became a living human being, but the last Adam has become a life-giving spirit. When you're in the spirit, you've taken on that new life, and you no longer are under the, the curse, and you have that comfort and that relief. Um, so again, oh, and let me point out also, Lamech, the father, whose name means a powerful one, Yeshua's father, Jesus' father, when he's referred to in that way, is Elohim Hayim. That means the most high God. He's also referred to as El Gabor, the mighty God, or the hero God. Is that not all names that show he is the powerful one? So the, the names between Lamech and Noah and between Yehovah, God the Father, and Yeshua, Jesus the Son, very much we see the foreshadowed picture. Now, Noah also is foreshadowed by his life. Noah was considered unique. He was considered sodic, righteous, and he was a deliverer for his family. He delivered his family from the, the, the flood by building the ark and taking them safely onto the ark. Yeshua was unique. Yeshua was a sodic, righteous one, and he was a deliverer, but not just for a family, not just for his earthly family, but for all flesh, all of mankind who will come to him. Both Noah and Yeshua were in that godly line starting from Seth. Going down through Seth, we're going to see who it goes through after Noah and all the way down. You know it very well when I say son of David and I continue the line, you know that we're talking about the promised one all the way back from Genesis 3.15 described there as the seed of the woman. And remember, when does a woman have seed? When it's miraculous. Otherwise, the seed is the man's. Okay, both lives, Sodic, both were blameless in their generation. You could not find fault in Yeshua in his earthly life. And we know that Noah represented himself in a way that was blameless before the people. He was representing God. Both walked with God. There's no doubt about that. We read in Genesis 6-9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. All of that could be said of Yeshua. He was a righteous man, blameless in his time, his earthly time on the earth, and he walked with God. Remember, he many a time went up on the mountain all night 
to be with his father because he just needed to be with his father. I can only imagine the, the, the separation. In fact, I can't imagine. Humanly, I can't. Now, Noah was righteous because he was obedient to God's commandments, and it made him stand out from all of his people in that day because we know the people were continually becoming more and more evil till every thought of theirs was only evil continually. So around him was debauchery, and yet he lived an exemplary life. He walked with God. That reminds us of Enoch, who so walked with God that we know that he was taken home. He didn't see death in the way that that the rest of the earth usually does. And Enoch, we know, also was exemplary in his lifetime. He was vibrant in his intimate relationship with his God. And here again, I draw on Yeshua's intimate relationship with Jehovah the Father. We know that Yeshua Jesus is referred to as righteous, 1 Peter 3.18. For the Messiah himself died for sins once and for all. A righteous person on behalf of unrighteous people, so that he might bring you to God. He was to put to death in the flesh, but brought to life by the Spirit. This is speaking of Yeshua Jesus. First John 2, 1 also. My children, I'm writing you these things so you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have Yeshua the Messiah, the Sodic, the righteous one, who pleads our cause with the Father. And Romans 5.19, for just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the other man, the other Adam, many will be made righteous. Yeshua came to do the will of his Father. That's John 5.19. Therefore Yeshua Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For what the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. He came to do the will of his Father. John 16.28, he said, it, I came forth from the Father, have come into the world. I'm leaving the world again and going to the Father. So Yeshua, we see looking to the Father, and we see that in Noah's life also. He didn't look to man, and he didn't follow man, but he pioneered the way or trailblazed the way to be obedient to the Father, hearing the voice of the Father uh, in heaven. And it's interesting also that that word blameless, when they were found blameless in relation to the sacrifice, it was free from defect. It was the unblemished animal that could be a sacrifice. So when Noah, when it said of him he was blameless or he was sodic, righteous, that's the idea that it's drawing. And we know Yeshua was so blameless that he could literally be or become the sacrifice acceptable to God for all of mankind. And that's where he stepped into that high priest role where he is our high priest for us. That's Hebrews 4, uh, 15, that even though in his flesh he was tempted, he was weak, he was tired, he was hungry, yet the difference was he did not sin. Hallelujah, he did not. First Peter 3.18 tells us Messiah himself died for the sins once and for all, a righteous person on behalf of an unrighteous people so that he might bring you to God. He was put to death, I think I read this a moment ago, put to death in the flesh, but brought to life by the Spirit. So both of their lives, Noah and Yeshua Jesus, were foreshadowed by obedience to become a lifesaver. Noah obeyed God. He was going to be the one to save a remnant of the people from all of the earth. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. That's Hebrews 11:7. Yeshua Jesus also was obedient. We see that he talks about being obedient and the results were the saving of his house. And when I say his house, I don't mean his mom and his dad. I don't mean Mr. and Mrs. and their children. I'm talking about the remnant, and that is the remnant through all age, those who come to saving faith in Yeshua Jesus. He was the, the one who saved them. He was the one that, um, um, oh, what's the word I want? It just went. He was the lifesaver, okay? He is the lifesaver for all who are saved. Um, there are better blessings, eternally better blessings. 
God bless Noah in chapter 9 and verse 1, Noah and his sons, but the greater are those spiritual blessings that we receive. And we read also in uh, Hebrews 2.11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. When Yeshua Jesus has sanctified us, has brought us into, sanctified is set apart, we've turned from sin and we're set apart unto God. When we come into that relationship with him, then he calls us brothers. And when we're brothers, we're joint heirs with him to all those blessings. Wow. Noah brought earthly blessings. Yeshua brings the spiritual and greater blessings. And they... Every blessing comes from Yeshua. Every blessing that God gives is eternal. Hebrews 13, 20. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. I love that. Doesn't wear out. Doesn't end. You go buy anything. You can get a warranty. That warranty has an ending date. It's a year. It's two years. Oh, you can buy extended warranty. Nowhere in Scripture do we need to go buy extended warranty. It's good forever. I love it. The days of Noah foreshadowed the time of the second coming of Mashiach to the earth. And we get that out of Matthew 24, 37 to 42. I may not read it all, but read that all on your own if I don't. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And we know we're close to that. We know evil thoughts are filling the earth continually. We're seeing man's evil toward fellow man. We are seeing their thoughts only for themselves. It's not far. The only difference is we've got more believers on this earth than Noah had in his day. But, verse 38, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Remember, they wouldn't listen to him. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. And in fact, I'll go ahead and read verses 40 and 40 on because 40 through 41, 42, because they're so misunderstood. But keep this in the context we've just talking about. I've just shown you how the picture of Noah coming through the flood is a picture of foreshadowing Mashiach and his second coming. Okay? When he comes in his second coming, what happens on the earth? Yeshua's coming in his second coming, and then we have the. Uh, Step on the Mount of Olives, sit on the throne in Jerusalem, set up his kingdom because it's going to be the, what's the word? What's it called? Yeah, but what's this period of time called on this earth? Thank you. Dar got it. I wasn't making myself clear, obviously. That's why I test it. This is where teacher needs to be more clear. The millennial kingdom, the millennium, that's what comes, what follows the second coming. The millennium is a time of peace on this earth. It's a time of a fresh start, really, for the earth from the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. So that's what God's saying. The earth is in desperate need of that right now. It's evil. It's it's horrendous. I mean, turn on the news. I don't care whether you go to local news, world news, it's bad out there. And this is preceding because God, God said when it's soon time for the Son of Man to come again, it's going to be like that. And keeping that in context, that's where we read, then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Now, how were they taken? And this is the twist that most people miss and don't understand. If I take you back to the time with Noah, those who got taken away in the flood, they were taken in judgment. The ones who were left went into coming out onto a new earth and living in a peaceful time. When these two are working in the field or grinding at the mill, one is taken away in judgment. That's not the rapture. The rapture is not judgment. The rapture is reward. The rapture is blessing. The, ble the rapture is wonderful. The rapture is nowhere in Matthew 24. It's not in that picture. 
The one's taken in judgment, the other is left to go into the millennial reign, the second coming of the Lord. When he's come down to earth, puts his feet literally on the earth, sits on the literal throne of David on earth, makes his temple. Oh, they thought they had a gorgeous one before. This one's going to be filled. The whole temple filled with the Shekhinah glory of our Lord. Wow. So keep it in context and realize the days of Noah foreshadow not the rapture. They're foreshadowing the second coming. Now, if we know that we're getting close to the second coming, we know the rapture occurs first. So we're that much closer to the rapture. So I've not taken it out and thrown it away. I'm just telling you it's not the picture here. So just, you know, understand that and follow keeping it in context. Okay? Now, Noah's Ark um, was what God used for the salvation of Noah and his family. And the master designer of Noah's Ark was God. And when we have Yeshua, our salvation, the master designer is God. He himself, planning it and designing it. Noah's Ark had one door. Yeshua tells us he is the door. John, Yochanan 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Do you see anywhere in there where he says, I'm one of the doors? I'm a door? I am the door. That's one door, that's a specific door, and it is the only door, and you have to enter through Yeshua, who is the door, to be saved. And I stress that because many want to say there are many roads that lead to God, and you all get there in the end, but there is no room for that in Scripture. Noah's Ark had one door. It didn't have many doors. It's a good picture. Noah's Ark was three levels, and if you forget all of this, this was chapter 6. Go back and read chapter 6 again for the description. Salvation has three levels. Good. I see the wheels turning. It's like, okay, where's she going? Salvation, past, present, and future. And I say this so that you are secure because you're in the Ark of your salvation. Now, in the middle of that storm, in the middle of the flood waters rising, did God ever kick Noah out? No. Would he have survived if God did? No. <laughs> he would have drowned. But our salvation is that secure always. It's not dependent on our righteous living. We're seen as righteous because of God's grace and his mercy seeing us through Yeshua. But we are saved past present and future by past i mean when we come into salvation we ask him for the forgiveness of our sins we ask him to forgive us for the sins we have done the sins we're currently doing and the sins we will do in the future and if you think that gives you a right to go act up and do anything you want and who cares because you got your salvation well i'll tell you there's a little woodshed out back and you're going to find it's not a happy place to be when your daddy has to take you there and teach you a lesson. <laughs> so you, you're not free from suffering consequences of your actions. But the guilt, the curse has been removed and you are saved forever. Second Corinthians 1.10 He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. He's going to deliver us from this earth. We know that day is coming. In the past, Yeshua delivered us from the penalty of sin. In the present, he's delivering us from the power of sin. If you stay in his power, you don't have to sin. You have the power to not sin. And in the future, he will deliver us from the very presence of sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't live in the presence of sin forever. Do you realize what that means? Just let that soak in for a moment. Your present reality of the future, when you're living with the Lord in his heaven, your heavenly home, there is no presence of sin. And I just cannot thank him enough. 
No more hearing the horror stories. No more heart burdens for those living through the horror stories. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more death. No more separation. Nothing. That sin is what has brought all of that that's gone forever. That's a huge hallelujah. That is so exciting that literally I can hardly stand to wait. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, and lastly, we see Noah released a dove from the ark. When there was peace, we knew it because of the dove. And that dove being a symbol of shalom is a symbol of the abiding presence of the Spirit of God. And we see it on Yeshua when he comes up out of the water showing that he has entered into the priestly role. Then we see the Spirit descending on him like the dove. And we're reminded of the dove that spoke shalom that Noah let out of the ark. So we see um, Noah's ark, a shelter. We see it represent God's grace to us. We find comfort. We find compassion. We find rest. And we even rest from our work because we don't earn it. We just simply receive God's gift. So Noah is a beautiful picture, I think, of Yeshua. And I wanted to bring that to you. Little sidetrack, we'll go right back now into Genesis, but we're here for the fuller picture. And that just enriches Noah and his life to me, and I trust that it's a blessing to you. It's a wonderful place to go park and focus when you get to the point that you just can't stand this world. <laughs> go take your Shabbat, take that rest, and focus and look at your future, and it will encourage you. It will lift your spirit. Anytime you're down, look up. Look up. That's all you need to do, look up. But sadly, Noah, who has lived such an exemplary life, done so well in being an example for us, we're about to find out, if you didn't know it, he wasn't perfect. He was human, and we're going to enter into that. But before we did, I want you, wanted you to see overall the character that he's remembered for, because when we go into our Hall of Faith, He's remembered for his faithfulness and his righteous living, and I'm thankful for that. I don't want to remember my mistakes either. I want to remember what I do right for the Lord. But we're looking now at uh, verse 19 first, and then we'll see what happened to Noah starting in verse 20. But verse 19 tells us, uh, oh, I think I need to do 18. I'm sorry. Okay, 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You say Ham and Japheth. Uh, we know that these are the ones who went into the ark. If we go back and we look at who went on to the ark, it was Mr. and Mrs. Noah, their three sons, and the three sons' wives. So we're finding out, once again, everybody who went in the ark came out of the ark. There was no death in the ark. Remember, the ark is not a picture of death. It has that pitch, that atonement, saved, saved forever, no death. These were the sons, um, verse 19 tells us, these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. That's huge. <laughs> the whole earth. That means in these three sons and their wives, all the physical characteristics of all the different nations and all the different tribes had to be present in their genetic constitutions. Okay, the, the genes had to have been there. We know that, that we use the word recessive genes. When we see someone that uh, has the, the coloring, the features of a grandmother or a great-grandmother, and they don't look anything like their parents, and it said, oh, well, it's the recessive genes that came up and came into play. But my whole point being, everything that we see from, and trust me, I see one race, the human race. We are all equal. I am not talking in any derogatory manner about any. But we'll see the Orientals with eyes that are very slanted. We will see Germanic that are light in color and big eyes. We will see, um, oh goodness, we will see those of, and if I'm saying anything wrong, forgive me, but of black heritage and the genes that fit that culture, or I shouldn't say that culture, but that genetic flow, all of this God put it in the gene pool. God loves variety. I see his variety in everything. He didn't create one flower, and we see that flower all over the world. We see different flowers in different places. There are flowers that grow in the desert. 
There are flowers that grow where it's icy and snowy and cold. It's amazing how they'll get flowers out of something like that. We see the variety in the fish in the sea. If you go to uh, Israel, to the Red Sea, one of the four richest for variety, you'll see things swim that you didn't know could be a fish. You thought it was part of the, the fauna, and it gets up and swims away. It's fascinating. And then if you go off our coast right here, you'll see whales and dolphins. You see such variety. Well, that's what God did in mankind. He made variety. He made us, and forgive me, he made us fat, he made us skinny, he made us tall, he made us short, he made us black, he made us white, he made us everything in between. And my point of stressing this is it gives no room for favoritism, for better than, for any of this divisiveness that we are having to this day and, and age, and you know why I'm on my soapbox, but people need to hear that. They also need to realize that because in very short time I'm going to bring out some who believe there's a curse on a specific group of people and how wrong it is, how out of the pit of hell comes that lie. So yes, I'm ramping up and stay with me. Okay, and if you don't know what I mean, you will in time. So, out of these three sons, out of their wives, the whole earth, all that we see and that we know today is, comes, goes back to one of these three sons. You've heard me say, I know that I'm of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, I'm going to take it back further. We haven't been introduced to Avraham yet. I can't wait to introduce you to him. He's, wow, what a, a character we'll study then. But I'm going back even further. And I will tell you because the homework's been done, the Jewish line comes through Shem. So I know I'm from the son Shem. But there are others who will be able to identify that they've come from Japheth or they've come from Ham, from the three different lines. Ham, Shem, and Japheth yeah. in your English. Okay, but you said Jewish comes from Ham and who comes from Jewish comes from Shem. Shem. Oh. Shem. The S H M. You're gonna get that. You're gonna get that in detail. You're gonna get almost a whole class on that. So oh, okay. hang tight. I have to write it down. You don't have to write it down yet. No, it'll get well, it will get spelled out, and I'll try to slow down enough then, or I can print it out for you, um, because we're going to see all the nations. So hang tight, and we'll, we'll show you. That's why, for those of you who got my text message for today, I, I asked you, you know, I told you we were going to come through Noah. We were going to see the com comparison of Noah and Yeshua. And then I said, and where did all the people come from? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to be thinking. So this is where we're going. All those physical characteristics of all the different nations and tribes are all present in these three sons who are going to populate and from them the whole earth will be filled. I think that covers the whole human race because I don't think there's any other apart from here on earth. And I shouldn't say I don't think. We know. We know God told us this is it. Anyway. Verse 20, we're going to see something begin to happen that, that saddens our heart, but it shows us how real Noah was and, and how real we are. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. Um, I think I can go ahead and just keep reading. Verse 21, he drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Now this is the first time wine is spoken of in scripture. We find it associated with drunkenness, with shame, and with a curse. Now, I'll let you draw your own conclusion where you want on that, but this is where we see the beginning. Because Noah had drunk the wine, because he became drunk, the next part happened, and he uncovered himself. The Hebrew says he bared himself. When it's saying that he uncovered himself, the Hebrew is giving us an idea that this was a deliberate act. There are those that try to say, oh, he was kind of unconscious, he didn't know what he was doing, and he just let it all hang out. That's the effect of drunkenness. But that's not what the Hebrew is telling us. I see to the contrary what we know, that, that, and I'm going to say alcohol rather than just wine, but we know alcohol makes man bold in his shame. That alcohol, man lets down his defenses. Um, what we're seeing, and I'm trying to 
think how to phrase it so that you can understand. We're seeing a defiance of man's need for a covering. Remember, Adam and Eve sinned and they suddenly were ashamed of their nakedness. They knew they needed to be covered. Perhaps the underlying theme here is Noah got caught up in his own righteousness. Felt like, I'm so self-righteous, I don't need to be covered. I'm not a sinner anymore. We don't know if he was saying those words. I'm not telling you he was, but the indication from the Hebrew is it was something more like that. That he just flagrantly was was saying he was okay the way he was. There's different words in the Hebrew for the nakedness, for the indecency. When we're told in Leviticus 18, starting with about verse 6, not to uncover the nakedness of different members of our family, that's a word for indecency, that's a word for the covering, what we do with our clothes to make ourselves decent. This word is more giving the, uh, the idea, the connotation that, that he was shameless, he was uncovering himself like look at me I'm the perfect specimen in other words something along that line if this was written by just man we wouldn't have this in here because this is blatant sin is what I'm trying to say to you and if you were writing your memoirs for the whole world to see usually you're gonna cover up your sin you're gonna cover up the parts that uh, you, it's, even if you're writing a story, your leading character, you want your character to be that above board and that quality. And what we're seeing is God is telling us the truth. He's leveling it where it's at. That this one who is righteous in God's eyes because he's been forgiven by the shed blood of Yeshua, in his humanness, he blew it. He did something that was very uncovering, very indecent in that sense, in some way he did something it wasn't you don't get the idea all from the Hebrew that it was accidental it wasn't he didn't know what he was doing because he was drunk he's not given any excuse in the Hebrew and let me also tell you that they say oh well he didn't know the wine would ferment or the grapes would ferment you know and that it would would have this intoxicating behavior well you're reading this story and you're thinking he got out of the ark you know a month or two ago planted and immediately got grapes and the grapes went sour and oh it was all accidental this could have happened a hundred or two hundred years after they were off the ark we don't know when it happened but Noah lives 300 years after he got off the ark and this is the only story we have out of those 300 years it's just this so somewhere in that span of time and I tend to think that um, absolutely, yes, there were new atmospheric conditions. Now the sunlight, the rays came through, the canopy over the earth was broken. We know that life is going to start to shorten in its length and all of that. But in this time, remember how we're in periods of time and we see that God dealt with man by their innocence, by their conscience. And then we said when Noah came off of the ark, and we've got a couple hundred years in here now, it's human government. It's man that, that, that is supposed to set the moral standard for man to live by. And what we're seeing is that the one who is to govern failed to govern his own body. So he fails the test. In human government, having a set of standards and rules, no one, not even righteous Noah, lives up to his moral laws all the time. We see Noah fell short. Um, that's not an oops, it's not a he couldn't have known and it was accidental and now he knew and he'd never do it again. No, scripture gives no room for that again. It's a deliberate act and we get the idea that he knew well what he was doing. He was just choosing. It was a rebellious spirit at that moment in time. Now again, remember we're forgiven past, present, and future, but we're seeing the reality that we are, until we're home with the Lord in our new bodies, we are still sin contaminated. We still have our faults. We still have to govern ourselves. And this is what Noah wasn't doing. He didn't govern himself. Let me show you a couple of verses elsewhere. Let me take you to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Where we read, whoops, okay. 
My tablet and I are not doing good yet, but hopefully we will real soon here. <laughs> Proverbs, what? Oh, that's my problem. Thank you. Okay, Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Would that be a good description of Noah right now? Yes, he wasn't wise, okay? He had his faults, he was human, and we see one of these faults, I think, even to show us, you know, the seriousness that we need to be governing ourselves lest we fall the same way. And I do think that um, wisdom from the Proverbs was, and I'll encourage you, alcohol, it usually brings a lot of grief onto people. They regret what they do. And yes, I do understand you do it and you don't know you've done it and you live with the consequences the next morning, but sometimes you live with the consequences for an entire life. And is it really worth taking that chance? Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 33 says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? All these things we know, you know, that, that those are sad sorrows and, and problems and we complain and we have wounds. But then it says, who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. Many of you may know the consequences of a, a mouth that slips and says something it shouldn't have said when it was under the influence of alcohol. So yes, we're seeing a warning against being under the influence. You know, we can definitely draw that also. But it was not that Noah couldn't know what he was doing and it was just an innocent mistake and it should be, oh, it's okay. No, that's not what the Hebrew is giving us. And when we see the, the life God wants us to live, even though he sees us as righteous, he's calling us out to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be working on our sanctification to be more like him. And he tells us not to be filled with wine. Instead, he says in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. And we all know what the fruits of the Spirit are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness. That's what we're supposed to be filled with. The spirit of alcohol, drunkenness, depression. People lose their self-control. They lose their wisdom. They lose their balance. They lose their judgment. And filling, being filled with the Holy Spirit, exact opposite. It's going to be a stimulant. It's going to be an influence. It's going to bring every aspect of our being to be better. It's going to help us live more righteously, live more in a, a way that is leading toward that perfect life that, yes, we never get there on earth, but we sure cer certainly should be striving for that. So Noah, um, his shame being hung out for here, I think is a huge lesson to us to realize we need to self-check constantly. Not look at somebody else who falls and think, ha, I'm so great, because pride goes before that fall. And there, but for the grace of God, go I. Yes, Dora. I think, well, the sin was in the act. The sin was what he was doing. And I think that even though the words are hard for us to fully understand, I think he was uncovering, um, how can I say this? He was, he was um, presumptuously saying, I'm righteous, so I don't need to be covered. Because covering was to cover sin. I'm righteous. I'm good. I've arrived. I get that idea that that's where he was at, that he put himself up on a pedestal. And we're going to see he didn't belong there. How do we see it? We see it in the flesh. We see it in the fact that he was uncovered and that there's something about that uncovering that as we go on right now, I'll explain to you why that in the flesh was not a good thing. Okay, let's go on and see if it doesn't finish my thought for you, what I'm saying to you right now. Verse 22 tells us what happened because he had drunk the wine and become drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. So he wasn't out where everybody else was. He is in his own tent. 
But again, what you do in the dark, that's who you are. That's what, what's said. If you really want to know what your character is, what do you do when no one's looking? So Noah was where he thought no one was looking. But his character is showing now. His character that was not righteous is what's showing. And unfortunately, Ham, or Ham from the Hebrew, the father of Canaan, uh, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Okay, Ham is going to publish his father's shame. Rather than seeing his father do something wrong and keep it to himself or try to cover it so that no one else does know, he dishonors his father's dignity. He dis dishonors his father's position of being like the governor of the race because we know Noah was the head. And so it's going to weaken Noah in the eyes of the people. It's showing us that the effect of human government against sin and evil is not you know, human government is not going to make one righteous. Um, Proverbs 14.9 says that fools make a mockery of sin. Well, Ham is going to act like a fool. He's going to make a mockery here. He's going to tell about this sin. But he couldn't have done that if Noah hadn't compromised himself. If Noah was governing himself, it would not have happened. But we see that he did not. Look with me also at 1 Peter 4.8. 1st Kepha, 1st Peter, chapter 4 and verse 8. 1st Peter 4 and verse 8, where we read, Be hospitable, oh, I'm sorry, that's verse 9. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, was Ham showing love toward his father when he goes and tells his brothers and broadcasts his father's sin? No, there's no love there. There's, he's not covering. We, if we see a fault in another, should not be the mouth that, that spreads it. We should be the one that covers it, that hides it, that does not put them out on display. And look also on your way back to Genesis at Shemot, at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Exodus 20 in the Hebrew Shemot and verse 12. And there we read, and this, of course, is in the time of the commandments, verse 12, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Was Ham honoring his father? No. No. So what he's doing is, I can't say it's even worse because sin is sin, but Ham is sinning as well as Noah. Now, in this description, back in chapter 9, in verse 22, we have something specifically said about Ham. We're told here that he's the father of Canaan, of Canaan. Now, we don't know anything about Canaan at this point. Those of you who do, it's because you've read ahead, <laughs> because we have more of the story. But we don't know anything about Canaan yet, but we're going to see that the, the Canaanites, the Canaanites come out of Ham's line, and because we know that the author of this probably is Moshe, Moses, it could be that he knowing where the line of, of the Canaanites are coming from, put this back in here. He, he you know, inserted it in, maybe even as an encouragement later for the Israelites that this is where the line comes from, but God is seeing to your preservation. Um, we don't know, but anyway... Um, Canaan, Canaan is going to be cursed. We're going to see that in verse 25. Just jump down there for a moment with me and see in verse 25 it says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. We'll talk about that curse when we get down there, but we know from here that Canaan that's going to be cursed, Ham's his father up here in verse 22, um, pulling this stunt of telling his brothers outside what his father had done. Now, we're not saying that Canaan is cursed because of Ham, but likely what's already happening, Canaan's probably already born, and he's probably walking in his father's footsteps, and his father is showing that he's not living a pious life, he's probably more rebellious, and 
doing sin himself, and that might have even been why he was rejoicing in Noah's sin, is it made him feel better about himself. You know, see, this one who you think is so righteous, look, he's sinning, so I'm not so bad when I sin. We definitely reap what we sow. If Ham is of that rebellious attitude, and he's raising his son, it the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they will say. It's a passing down. It's also a genetic passing down, and we'll talk more about that in the curse as we come to it. Let me tell you at this point also the name Canaan, Canaan, did not come from the land. Everybody thinks that. As soon as you say that, they go to the land of Canaan, and they think that's where the name came from. But first, it was the father's name. It was Ham's Ham's son is Canaan. Canaan's going to have his own children, and he's known as Canaan. Then his family's going to be known by that name. It's not going to signify the lowland. It's not going to signify the land. You know, like today we say, I'm an American because I was born in America. They didn't say, I'm a Canaan because I was, I, I'm a Canaanite because I was born in Canaan. No, I, I'm, a Canaan, I'm a Canaanite because my father is Canaan. So we're seeing it's a line. It's a family name. It's a line of people. It's the name of the father of the tribe, if you want to call it that. And it was transferred to his descendants and to his descendants after him. Eventually, they took possession of a specific area of land. And so that, that land does become called Canaan. But it literally means submissive one. The way that it's saying submissive is this was one that had to stoop down and had to submit. The idea I immediately hear in that is slavery, not the kind of submission we willingly do to our Lord. But this is one man forcing another to submit, to be slave-like. So if Ham named his son, submit, stoop down, be a servant, you get the idea that Ham was, was as a father, probably like a tyrant, probably very, you know, you're here, you're my kid, you're to serve me, you're to do for me, probably had a pretty bad attitude. Um, if we take that in, in view of the submission to God's commands, we might be seeing that Ham didn't have a heart toward God's commands, and he's not passing that down to his children either. And we see that even though Ham named his son, submit, you be submissive to me, God was allowing that name because God's going to show that this people that come from Ham are going to be in a submissive, in a subservient, in a slave status um, continually. They get no inheritance in the land, and we'll see that the, the Canaanites, some of them became slaves to Shem's line, um, under Solomon even, the, his forced labor um, army. And we see often the yoke of slavery in the line of the Canaanites. So God was maybe foreshadowing in their name, but Ham was probably saying it because he was saying, you know, I'm the authority. I'm the one you kowtow to what I say. It must not have been nice living in Ham's home. I'll just be honest, okay? Now, here's where I want to be really clear Part two of that, when I was on my soapbox about humanity, the human races, all the genes in the pool, and, and God brings out different genes, different genetic qualities, or, or you know what we see. In earlier generations, and unfortunately even down to today, there, there are prejudiced people that they regard as the descendants of Canaan, and they're wrong, but they said, oh, they're the black people from Africa, and they use that to say the black people from Africa should be in slavery. And I'm telling you, throw that out, send it back to the pit, because that's where it came from. The black people did not come from Canaan, from Canaan. Canaan was the father of the Near Eastern people, and many of them were conquered by Joshua when Israel took the Promised Land and went into that slavery type of lifestyle. But they're not genetically seen as the black people. That's not where they came from. We'll see where, where that, we'll see that line in just a bit. But I say that because it's a horrible, horrible teaching. 
and it causes division and it was used to try to justify what was done to the black people and there is no justification for what was done to our black fellow brethren who are just as equal as the white, the brown, the red, and the blue if you can find a blue. <laughs> and God put us all on an equal standing again one race called the human race. There's just different varieties in that human race because God likes variety. And so do I. And can you imagine if everybody looked the same, how would we know who's who? <laughs> we need those differences. But back on track, we've got Ham now in verse 22 of chapter 9 that he saw his father's nakedness, okay? Hebrews says he gazed at it, and you get the idea with great glee or with satisfaction. I think Ham probably resented the righteousness of his father. You'll hear somebody who lives a good life and those around them don't, oh, look at the goody two-shoes. Look at how they go. I think that was Ham's attitude toward his dad. Instead of saying, I'm being called out, I need to straighten up, I need to change. Instead, he resented his father's authority. He resented his father living right and calling him out. And I think we see very much a callous, a carnal, a rebellious spirit in him, even to the point of what he names his son and the idea that we get of what must have been happening in his life. Now again, remember this could be 100 to 200 years after the flood. So they've had a long time to be living under this human government. They've had a long time for Noah to live as the one reigning and ruling over them. And I see in it, all the way back before man was created, I see it as a snapshot, smaller picture of Satan in heaven. How did he find it in his heart to want to be in God's place, to want the worship to come to him, to want to dethrone God? God is love. God is perfect. God is grace. God is mercy. God never dealt badly with Satan. He made him beautiful. He put him in charge of a lot. He gave him a kingdom. He gave him gifts. Satan had no reason to turn and betray his creator. And I'm not saying that Noah is Ham's creator, but I'm saying draw the, the same comparison, that same spirit that brought Satan down. We saw it once before in the human race. We saw it with Adam and Eve. He whiz, weaseled his way in and he, he got to them with that same sense of pride. Oh, you'll be like God. You'll know everything God knows. You'll be raised up. And of course, instead, is a, is a fall. And here's what we see happening here. Now, secondly, I also want to bring out to you that nothing in the Hebrew indicates a homosexual act. Because there's that teaching out there that, that it was a homosexual act that was taking place. But if that were true, then the word for nakedness would have been what, what is used in the Hebrew in Leviticus 18 in verse 7 in particular. And here we're told... Ham saw, not that Ham participated, not that anyone else was participating. He saw Noah, and he saw Noah doing something very ungodly. Now, the fact that Ham was on the ark, Ham was saved. Ham was a believer in the true God because the only ones who perished in the flood were the unbelievers. And if Ham was not a believer, he wouldn't have been in the ark. You don't read that Noah pulled him in kicking and screaming. No, he helped his dad build the ark. The family was righteous in their, in their stand before God. They found grace by God and they were placed in the ark. So if Ham was a true believer, and I believe he was, then I don't believe that his behavior would have been... Okay, I'm having a hard time saying it, but understand, you know where I'm coming from. The homosexual lifestyle is not a lifestyle that goes along with one who is a child of God. Now, I'm not telling you go call everybody out and tell them what they are, but you call out the act. The act is showing it's a sinful act against God, and that's what we're calling out. You love the sinner, you hate the sin. 
come being one who had faith in God, his lifestyle would not be the, the, the type of lifestyle so bent against God. It's what I am saying. Now, No, I'm saying he wasn't, that this wasn't a homosexual act, that isn't what was going on. That Ham was a believer in God, and even though he does sinful things like we all do, his whole lifestyle would not have been so uh, adamantly opposed to God's lifestyle. In other words, and I, I just got to say it, and if I get in trouble, I get in trouble. I, I stand by my convictions. One who lives a homosexual life, if they give their heart to the Lord, they accept the Lord as their Savior, they are going to be convicted of that lifestyle. They're not going to be able to live that lifestyle, continue it on, and feel like they're justified. They're going to feel the conviction. They're going to feel the tug. They're going to feel, oh, I can't live this kind of lifestyle. That's what I'm saying. Ham was not one that was living that kind of lifestyle and nowhere do we read that he did something with his father he only saw so it throws out that whole lie that they used to try to say this is what was going on and you can be a believer and you can do this too okay i'm standing against it it's unpopular i don't care i'm going to stand with my god i'm going to stand with what the scripture says and if they want to haul me away for it haul me away for it i'm going to keep saying it and I'm going to keep saying it because I've got to stand by the word of God. Roger? Basically, he just walked in and saw, oh, yes, naked, turn around, walk back, and go, hey, I saw that naked. They grabbed the coat. Well, 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 don't get ahead of the story. Don't get ahead of the story. You're right. <laughs> but hold on. Yes, he saw what Noah was doing. He loved it. He had glee in it. He had satisfaction in it, even though he should have been heart sick at it. It shows a rebellious spirit. And he goes and he broadcasts it. The last thing I want, if I'm doing something wrong, is to have someone see it and then go tell everybody about it. Well, that's what Hom did, okay? Um, he publishes it. And actually, if he had been in that act with his dad, then he wouldn't have been out there publishing it. He wouldn't have been saying, see, 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 see. You know? But that's what he was doing. So if you haven't heard that argument, you'll come up against it sometime because it is so popular. And it's like, where do they get that? Well, it's the fact that they have to try to find a way to justify and right their wrong. Again, maybe that's what Noah was doing in his I'm so righteous, I'm not a sinner, I don't even need clothes, I don't need to be covered. Adam and Eve need to be covered because they were sinners, but I'm righteous now. It may be that he kind of got caught up in his own righteousness. You know, We just don't know exactly what it was, but it's more along that line. Yes? And he could have thought about that too before they fell, they were naked anyways. So he could have thought back to that point, well, before they built, they were naked, so I could still be naked. And yeah, time. and maybe he did think he'd earned the right to be in that status, that state before sin. Maybe so. Don't know. One day we can ask if we want to know. I have a feeling we're not going to care. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's more important things to talk about in heaven than this. <laughs> but uh, okay, so he saw the nakedness of his father and he told. Again, the Hebrew idea behind the words is he told with delight. Um, he was conspicuous about it. He made it known. He's declaring it. Um, again, I'm seeing a rebellion against his father, against his father's authority. I'm seeing maybe he's resenting. Maybe he even was, was thinking of himself, well, he's told me I have to live morally and I have to live right, and then he gets to go do that. He was seeing a hypocrisy in his father if he was seeing it that way. Whatever it was, he, I think, had a real attitude himself I think he resented God, and he resented God's roles on his life, the same that Cain resented it also. Remember, God warned Cain, if you will humble yourself now, if you'll turn from that, the, the sin that's there at the door, crouching, ready to devour you, it'll be gone. All Cain had to do was play by the rules, was make the sacrifice that he had been told to make. All Ham needed to do was be obedient to the authority that God was putting over them in human government. That we see this character trait 
that is against that, and that's the same that we'll see show up in the descendants that are called the Canaanites. And here's where I'm telling you that we do see genetic traits in family lines, not in divisions. It's not like, well, the, the, only the Orientals do this, or only the black people do that, or only the Jewish people do that. No, we see genetic traits, so we see, you know, a stubborn streak in a father and in a son and in the grandson and, you know, so forth, and I'm not picking on just the men. I'll say it for the women also, but you see a passing down. You see a genetic um, weakness toward alcohol definitely runs in a family and you'll see it if you see and I'll, because I picked on the men now I'll pick on the women let's say that the mother of the, of the home was one that imbibed in alcohol and she passes down that gene in her children her children have trouble with alcohol and they have trouble that's what I'm saying you will see genetic traits and the traits that the Canaanites become known for I can see them coming from, if Ham was as rebellious and ornery as what we're seeing, that fits their genetic traits that we see of them as a people in time to come. And in ancient time, to see the one's father's nakedness was considered a breach of the family ethic. It was, it, it hit at the heart of the family. It was destroying the sanctity of the father, the strength of the father. It made a mockery of the father. That's the way the home value was at that time. We've come so far from that, I have to explain that because we don't see that in the home today like it should be. So Noah's sin gave occasion for his son to sin. Our sin doesn't just affect us, it affects those around us. And he goes and he takes it outward. It says he told his two brothers outside. That gives us the idea that it was, I'm going to say it this way, published openly. So it didn't just stop with the two sons. Hom was probably out there at the top of his line saying, look at my dad, look at what he's doing, look at the fool he's making of himself, look at the one who says he's righteous, and look at his unrighteousness. And he's shouting it, and the other tents are close by. And they're hearing, and then now they know. Well, what does that do to the one they've been looking at that's been representing God to them? It belittles him in their eyes. And that's the idea of what we're getting. Because of that, we see the exact opposite in the other two sons. Shem and Japheth, where I cut Roger off and didn't let him go on, acted out of respect. They still had respect to their father, and that's why the way they dealt with it is they took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, walked backwards, so one's holding one side, the other's holding the other side, they've got the blanket in between, Noah's behind them. Instead of seeing it for themselves, they kept their eyes out and they walked backwards. They could kind of tell where he was and he probably was laying on the ground, he probably had passed out at this point, and they let the blanket drop and cover him without their ever seeing their father's nakedness. That was a respectful way to deal with it. That's what Ham should have done in the beginning. As soon as he saw, he should have thought, oh, I don't want anyone else to see this. Let me cover it up. And that's what we should be doing for each other, not broadcasting one another's faults, but helping to cover them, not condoning, but covering, because it doesn't do any good. All this did was spread it abroad and hurt more people and the respect of the one that was in authority over them. Well, whatever it was that, that happened, they didn't see their father's nakedness, but when Noah awoke, that's why I think when they covered him, he had passed out by that point. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. Okay, he sobered up, he comes out of it, he slept it off or whatever, and he knew. We're not told how he knew, but the only way I can figure he knew is because if it was broadcast, it got back to him. They all had heard it. They're all talking about it. It's pretty hard for that to be kept a secret at that point. So I think, in essence, we might say he was the talk of the town, and the whole town's talking about his sin. How sad that is. you know. But it, I see it in too many that want to jump on the one thing somebody does wrong instead of, Overlooking that, covering that, remember love covers a multitude of sins. Loving him through it and not allowing it to 
to go down and harm others. He knew what his youngest son, um, that lets us know that, that harm, uh, well, actually, let me take you to Genesis 10, 21, because we're going to get into trouble. It's hard to understand the three sons. We think we know the order, but they get spoken of in different ways. So go to Genesis 10, 21 for just a moment with me. And in 10, 21, it says, Also to Shem, the father of the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth's children were born. So when we read that, we get the idea that Ham came in the middle. Shem was the youngest, Japheth was the oldest. So what we probably ought to say here is his younger son. He knew what his younger son had told him because it does seem that that's more the correct order from the Hebrew. A little hard to understand. Um, the same way that, that Hebrew will talk about a, a grandchild and a son with the same terms, so you have to either know the genealogy to know it wasn't a son, it was a grandson, but the Hebrew doesn't make it that clear. Um, anyway, it, was, it wasn't the oldest son. And remember, the oldest son has those extra responsibilities of taking care of the parents and so forth and so on. Law hasn't been given yet, but we are going to see a lot of the law were things that were already being taught and being in effect. So um, anyway, um, it may even indicate in there, cannot say it dogmatically, but it may even indicate in there that a younger son of Ham's, because remember we think Canaan was already born, that maybe Ham and his son saw, and maybe that's how the broadcasting went so quickly too. Ham goes and tells the brothers, and the grandson takes off and tells others too, because he's following his dad's example. It could be. I'm not telling you it is what happened, but it could be. And again, with that ancient, um, uh, what do I call it, that ancient standard that to see the, the father's, the not just, yeah, the, maybe the patriarch of the family, the disrespect for the family, um, I mean the disrespect for that head of the family in this, it, again, it looks like it hit not just Noah's immediate family, but it hit the next generation and then it would be carried on down. So it was a great um, blatant mark. And God's going to meet it with a great punishment. Had it been something bad in God's eyes, because God doesn't just say, oh, that was a little boo-boo. No, he's going to hit this one hard. When we are rebellious against God and we're hard in our rebelliousness, there's a harder consequence than one who accidentally steps out of line and is easily corrected. So that's what I'm trying to say. As we go down and see this curse, it's not just God sl slapping the, the wrist. It's God smacking and saying, this was wrong. Consequence. The same way when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it had a huge consequence. It fell on them. It fell on all mankind from them. It fell on the earth. Everything suffered the consequence. That wasn't a little slap on the wrist either. God took that very seriously, and he took whatever this was here very seriously also. Let's go on, and we'll see that as we read about um, the, the punishment that's going to come from it. I think I'm in chapter 10. I can't tell. Nope, I was in 9. Hold on just a moment, and I'll be back. Um, we're in verse 24 of chapter 9. And we have, when Noah woke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done to him. So he said, now Noah's going to speak this, but he's speaking prophetically. It's a declaration that from Ham, or Ham, would descend an inferior and a servile posterity. That's going to be what they're going to inherit. They're going to inherit a, more of a carnal, more of a materialistic nature. They're going to inherit the lives of ending up in slavery. They're not going to be filled with the blessings of the Lord. What he says is, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. Okay, Ham had done the sin as a son, and he's going to see the punishment carried on down in his son. Again, not because his son gets what he doesn't deserve. No, the, the son of Ham probably was just like his dad and even helping maybe to broadcast it. So we're seeing it pass down. 
Um, Canaan himself may not have felt the fullness of the consequences, but his descendants certainly would when time after time, year after year, they're brought into subjection under the descendants of their two of the two brothers because we're going to see Ham's lineage in subjection often to Shem or to Japheth's children. So again, I see in that the beginning of where we know God says that the sins of the father are visited on the generations. What we do has consequences. If you had a father that did things right in the home, he set you up well for life. If you had a father that did not drink away the, the money, didn't take care of you, you see the consequences in your own life. That's what we're seeing. Um, it, it does indicate again to me, I think likely, that Canaan, the son of Ham, already was born and probably already living a rebellious lifestyle too. But again, I can't say that, uh, you know, it's just that you, you can read it in Hebrew definitely. I just can't be dogmatic. Um, and Ham is the progenitor, if I haven't made that clear, of the Canaanites, the Canaanites. They came through his son Canaan, that's why they were called Canaanites. Later the land that they did have um, bear, bears that name. But um, also from Ham, and I'll repeat this, but also from Ham come the Ethiopians, the Libyans, the Egyptians, and the Africans. Um, but it was not a special curse against the blacks. It wasn't that Ham was black and now all the black people are cursed and that they have, wear this curse and the curse they wear is being black. No, not at all possible from the Hebrew and I don't even see in the English. It's just simply their descendants are going to suffer the consequences of a rebellious life not being in rightness and they're going to be in subjection because Noah is the one giving the curse, but he's speaking prophetically. And what, what he was speaking, God allowed him to speak because it was what was going to happen. We find that Ham has no blessing, um, that we'll see Shem and Japheth get blessed, where Ham, there's no blessing given. And Cain was probably um, singled out again as a special encouragement to the Israelites centuries later who are going to go up and occupy the promised land and if you don't know the Canaanites are one of the first that they come up against when they go into the land of Canaan it's one of the first that they're going to be fighting with so um, it probably is why they're given that history here's your first enemy really to speak of in the promised land and here's their line where they came from so somebody can't say well where did these people come from <laughs> this is where they came from okay um, and again we're going to see in the fulfillment of this because in the history of Ham to give you an example Nimrod is going to come from Ham He's going to be Cush's son. This is Genesis 10, verses 6 through 8. We might get there yet today. I don't know how far we'll get into chapter 10. But Nimrod founded a city. He founded the empire of Babylon. So when you hear about Babylon, and if you think something in particular, yes, that's chapter 11. We're building toward that. We're going to see that um, Nimrod's in Ham's line, and we're going to see how evil Nimrod is. Mitzrayim is another son of Ham. He's going to be the father of the Egyptians. We'll see that in Genesis 10:6. But we also are told in Psalm 78:51 about the, the Egyptians. Let me read that for you. Psalm 78 and verse 51. Whoops, I went too far too fast. There we go. Verse 51 says. Uh, can I jump in there? And smote all the firstborn in Egypt. The first issue of their virility in the tents of Ham. So here you've got the Egyptians being smote, and we're being told that they were from the tents of Ham. That means they were, uh, Ham was their ancestor. So the Egyptians are going to come up against the Israelis. We're going to see that they suffer consequences for it. And for a time, both Egypt and Babylon were great. They, they raised up as great kingdoms, nations, whatever you want to call them. You can't really call them a nation, but they were great. But subsequently, they're both reduced to subjection. First, the Persians that came from Shem, 
and later by the Greeks and the Romans who came from Japheth. So that's how I'm telling you that Ham's descendants we're going to see go into subjection and into slavery from descendants of his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, that those lines um, have the higher stand. Um, Alex, Alexander the Great came from Japheth. He defeated the Phoenicians in 331 BC. The Battle of Carthage, if you're familiar with that, in 146 BC, is the Phoenicians who were the Canaanites. They're defeated again. So Ham's line, the Canaanite line, defeat and defeat and defeat. The whole of Africa descended from Ham, and for many centuries we see the greater part of Africa was under the dominion of Rome, then of the Saracens, um, that was any Arab tribe living in the Sinai Peninsula was called a Saracen, and even the Turks who came from Japheth's line ruled over Africa when the descendants of Ham. So again, do not equate a certain color with a place. That's, we're not talking color. So, um, Canaan's line, Ham's line, we're being told, is going to be cursed. What about the others? Let's go back to Genesis 9. Go back to verse 26 now. I think we finished 25. Um, I think I made it clear. A servant of servants, they will serve those who are, are servants also. Um, they'll be that to his brother. So in the family, they're going to serve their relatives. They're going to be under their relatives. He also said, Noah, in verse 26, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So where Ham's line is going down and is going to be subservient, we don't see the blessing of the Lord. We don't see that, that they had this um, bend to look to the Lord. But in this line, we are seeing, Blessed be Jehovah, the God of Shem. That indicates that the religious preeminence, I'm trying to find something I can put on my papers here, sorry. <laughs> I have no idea why all of a sudden everything's blowing, but it is. Maybe somebody doesn't like what I'm teaching right now. Um, here, I've, I've got something, Roger, that'll do it. I can hook it on right there and I'm good. Okay, um, so, blessed be Jehovah, the God of Shem. Remember how we had Cain and of all Cain and of all, you would have said of Abel's line that that was the godly line. You would have said of Canaan, King Cain's line, this is the rebellious line. You wouldn't have called Cain's line those from Jehovah, blessing Jehovah. But you would have Abel had he had descendants. We know that we had the godly line of Seth that replaced Abel. Now as we come down a little further, we're seeing that same idea again. We're seeing that Shem's line looked to Jehovah. Ham's line apparently did not. It was the, they weren't the religious band, they were the, the rebellious band. But the preeminent religious line, so to speak, is going to be seen in Shem. And Shem is the father of what becomes Israel. Exodus 29:45, Shmot 2945. And I'm not telling you rebellious Israel but I'm telling you the people who are called Israel. Exodus 29 and verse 45. Exodus 29 and verse 45 where we read, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. That's Shem's line that's come down that God's talking about at that point. So the title that's given here, this blessed be the Lord God of Shem, that was like an expression of the covenant relationship that God would enter in a covenant relationship with Avraham. Avraham is a descendant of Shem. So we're seeing the fulfillment of that, that foreshadowing, that prophecy. That line's going to head all the way to Messiah. So we've got Shem, Avraham, David, Messiah. Okay, that's the the godly line, the, the line that has the band to look to God, and we see it reflect in their name when they call themselves, um, what the, the Lord God of Shem shows that covenant relationship. Okay, now the Hebrews that came from Shem, the Semitic races come from Shem. 
um, Genesis 10, 21. We won't get that far today, but the word Eber there, E-B-E-R, or ever in the Hebrew pronunciation, it probably was a derivation of the name Hebrew. So ever probably was the more ancient way to say what became known as Hebrew. But what we're seeing just is God telling us prophetically how these lines of people would go. We've got um, to just accept that this is fact, that I'm not talking about individuals. Were there individuals in Ham's line that had a relationship with God because they were obedient to God? Absolutely, I'm sure there were. There's exceptions in the rules, but the family line as a whole was seen as a rebellious line. Do you remember when we were doing the seven generations from Adam? And when we came down Cain's line, we came down to the one who was bragging about, you know, I've killed, I've murdered plenty, and I don't have a mark on me, but if you come against me, it's going to be bad for you and all of yours, you know, because he was so puffed up in his pride that he could murder people if that's what he wanted to do. In Seth's line, when, when we came down the seventh from Adam, we saw Lamech who gave birth to Noah, and we've already talked today about his character, how he looked to God to be the comfort for us that brings us out from under the curse that otherwise we are, are living under. So we're talking about the band of people groups. We see that today. We see that in a people group there is a prevalent, okay, if I can call it a religious band, toward other gods. That it's just prevalent in those lines. So we see many people of that descent worship that little g god okay I'm, I'm trying to leave it a little more generic but i think you understand what i'm saying um would there be a line today known to be the line that really is obedient and follows god it would be wonderful the closest we can get to that is what we call a conglomeration from all peoples is called the church, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the on fire for the Lord church that is trying to be obedient, obey the Lord, serve the Lord, put him first. That would be our godly line today. But it's not made up of just one people's group. It's made up of all, you know, that, that have come together because, again, God's dealing in, in, in individual lives. There isn't a... a group line that's followed down descendants that has stayed with what we see in the beginning where Shem's line was so faithful to God they're calling they're called this the God of Shem the Lord God of Shem I hope I'm making myself clear I feel like I'm talking in a circle <laughs> but I, I hope you're getting the idea let me show you Canaan's um, servanthood okay when it said that Canaan's going to be the servant of his brothers families look at Joshua 9 3 we'll go there first we're going to do several references here uh, so if you don't like to look it up I'll read it for you um, if you have the cross references they definitely are on there Joshua chapter 9 we're going to look at verse 20. Well, we'll start with verse 3 to give us our background here. Verse 3 says, When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Yahshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, then they're going to look to add, but what I'm just telling you is inhibit, in, inhabitants, I'm trying to talk too fast, of Gibeon. Okay? That's verse 3. Take that down to verse 23. Same chapter, verse 23 says, Now therefore you are cursed. And you shall never cease being slaves, both hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And verse 27 says, But Yahshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation, for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place in which he would choose. So Joshua made servants out of the Gibeonites. He made them serve the, the righteous believing line that Joshua was leading, he made them cut the wood for the sacrifices, for the altar. He made them carry the water. They did all, it was forced labor. And they were the Gibeonites. Well, the Gibeonites come from Canaan. So here's an example. Yes? What is the e Example. Oh. Yeah. Um, the Amorites were also from Canaan's line. Look with me at 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, 
2 Samuel chapter 21, and there we're going to look at verse 2. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Then they're in parentheses. Now the Gibeonites were not the sons of Israel. They weren't the line of Shem, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them, which was a boo-boo, but... We're not here to do Second Samuel. We're here to do Genesis. So I'm just showing you the Amorites came from the Gibeonites. We see that they are also um, subservient to, um, to the godly line, to Shem's line. Um, when we read about it in Genesis 10, which we'll do next week, I can see obviously now, it's verses 15 and 16. But we'll take chapter 10 next week. Um, if you wondered where did those nations come from, where did we get all these people, how do we follow the lines, stay tuned. Next week we'll look at all these nations and I'll give you your homework. See if you can find out how many nations we get out of chapter 10. It's a significant number. That's all I'll say. You've got to come back next week to know the answer. <laughs> or do your research and find it out on your own. Okay, Judges 1 and verse 28 also tells us that the Canaanites were used for forced labor. Let me go ahead and prove it. I want to make sure I'm getting my point across to you. So we'll go real quickly to Judges chapter 1. If I can spell it right for my tablet, which does not like my fingers today. Judges chapter 1. There we go. Okay. And verse 28. And here we read, It came about when Israel became strong, that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Okay, so they used them for their forced labor. Um, 1 Kings 9 verses 20 and 21 tells you the same thing. The Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites are always mentioned with the, the Canaanites, and on your cross-references you have more, uh, cross, more verses to look up. Joshua 9.1, um, you have them named the Jebusites in Genesis 10. We'll deal with who that is when we're there in Genesis 10, verse 16. The Hivites are named in Joshua 9, verse 1. All of these are the subservient. They end up becoming slaves to Shem's line. And they came out of the line of Canaan, so it shows you Noah was speaking prophetically when he put that curse on that line. They're going to carry the results down through the, the generations. Okay? Any questions, comments? Yes, Dora. So uh, am I going too far ahead? Isn't it uh, when Moses took them out of the slavery thing, they were supposed to kill every one of the Canaanites or somewhere along the line? When they entered into the promised land, that's exactly what they were supposed to do. But what did we just read? Did they do it? And did they pay the consequences? Yes, yes. Was that from Ham? Yes, yes. Egypt comes, the, the Egyptians um, that settled were Ham's line, Ham's line, yes. Yes, and we, we, you'll get that again next week. If you're, if you're a little foggy today, hang on. Next week will probably really clear it up for you because we'll look at the peoples. We'll look where, where they went and where they came from because we're giving it in the genealogical list, okay? I think it's Psalm 78 that I read to you earlier that mentioned Egypt and Ham. How many nations came out of? Out of our three sons. Okay, but is that after they were dispersed, that they, I mean, not within the 300 years after they landed, it was after they were... It goes down generations, yes. Yeah, we're long past Noah's life when we talk about... Like when Joshua led them into the promised land and they were to fight against the Canaanites, Noah was long sleeping. I shouldn't say that way because he, he was in the heart of Sha'ol. He was in, the, in what is known later as Abraham's bosom because he was righteous. He was not in the suffering side. So righteous in Yeshua. Play that song. Play that song. I haven't heard that in years. Father Abraham had... Father Abraham had three sons. Three sons had Father Abraham. 
Okay. That's all you hear in the song. Okay. Father Abraham had three sons. Three sons had Father Abraham. Dave, you're our music man. You know that one? And he's saying no. Okay. I want to mix it up with um, the Arky Arky song. So <laughs> you're taking me back to childhood days. So, um, okay. Let me see. I think, let's go ahead. I think I can. I, I'll bring you to another point that I'm going to bring out next week, and that'll make you, if you don't care about the nations, maybe you'll care about coming back to hear this next part. So let me go just another verse and part of the next, and we'll stop there. We're not going to cover all the way to the end, but close. Our next verse tells us, May God enlarge Japheth. Okay, he's told that, um, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Canaan's going to be a servant. Then we're now talking about the third son, the older son. May God enlarge Japheth, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So see, Canaan's going to be a servant to both his brothers, to Ham, I'm, I'm sorry, to uh, Shem and to Japheth. Japheth in our Hebrew, it means enlargement. His was to become the largest race. The Caucasians, known as the Gentiles, we'll see in Genesis 2, I'm sorry, Genesis 10, verses 2 and 5, come from him. And when it talks about that they were to dwell in the tents of Shem or to live in the, Shem, I'm trying to hurry, sorry. When it says they were to live or dwell in the tents of Shem, that was the way of saying they were to be blessed through Shem's line. And since we know Messiah comes from Shem's line, the descendants all the way down will be blessed through Shem's line because the whole world who believes in Yeshua Jesus is blessed through Yeshua Jesus who in his earthly flesh was Jewish, which was the line that when you take it back, it's Shem's line that they come from. So it's fulfillment of it. And again, um, Canaan, Canaan, Ham, that line, is to be servant to both Japheth and to Shem, so to both of them. Okay, then we hit verses 20 and 29 real quickly. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Remember, he entered the ark at 600, so he lived 350 years after he lived to be 950 but the last 300 years, nothing else is mentioned, just that this one episode that mars Noah's character. Um, he was the third in the line for longevity. Um, Methuselah lived the longest, 969 years. Jared lived 962 years. And then Noah lived uh, 950 years. And by the way, in case you don't remember, entering the ark at the age of 600 was Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6. Okay? Now, this is where um, I'm going to come back to it. Well, let me give you one more verse, not in, in Genesis, but let me tell you that Paul jumps on this and expounds the spiritual lesson. He warns the godly, and that's where we'll end with our scripture, and then I'll tell you what I set you up for for next week. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, and this is a warning to us today. That's why this is how we can apply what we've been learning in this lesson. Um, verse 27, Paul saying, But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. That's a warning to us. We know how we're supposed to live, and we should be living an example of a life godly unto the Lord. But we know that we have two parts to us. We have the spiritual and we have the flesh. And Paul tells us elsewhere, he crucifies the flesh so that he can please the Lord in the spirit. And here he's saying, I discipline my body. I put down that flesh so that lest after I tell you how you should live, I get disqualified by not doing what I'm saying. So it is a warning to us. We want to be godly. We don't want to be disqualified. We don't want to be castaways. We don't want to be disapproved of. We don't want to know that, that type of rejection. We need to realize if one as righteous and living right as Noah, who's put on that level of being an example in the hall of faith if he could have an episode that that really tore at his character it behooves us to watch ourselves crucify our flesh that we not have 
something found in us to disqualify us from being an example of how to live a godly life to the others who are watching us. So, having said that, next week, when we come back, I'm going to show you between the history of Noah and the history of Adam that there is an extraordinary resemblance. And it doesn't mean it's all bad, folks, <laughs> okay? But come back next week and see how Noah and Adam can be compared and what we learn and what we see from that. Then we'll launch from that into a study of all these nations, who came out of the three sons, where they went, and if you didn't do your homework, I'll answer your question. How many nations do we get and what's the significance of that number? So that will probably take us a whole class, but it should be a good class, an exciting class. I hope it'll be a blessing to all. Um, let me close quickly in a word of prayer, and then I will, shalom, man. then I will um, ask for questions or comments or whatever. I hope today didn't just muddy the waters, but if it did, come back next week, and I think we'll be clarifying. So what do we have to read to find the answer? Your Bible. <laughs> And because you can't read it all from cover to cover by next week, <laughs> read through chapter 10 and just see what you can begin to discern about, you know, how many nations you see coming out of that. And if you want to keep count and track and see where you come up with. And if you get the right answer, if you come up to the right one, you probably will know, oh, I, I do know that number is significant in other scriptures. You may or may not. But, you know, how we know certain numbers do tell us different things. We'll get all of that out of chapter 10, yes. We'll go elsewhere. You know me. We cross-reference. We'll go elsewhere. But it, it does come out of chapter 10. Um, the comparison that you'll see of Noah and Adam, you'd have to keep going back to the beginning chapters on Adam's life, and you'd have to go back to Noah's life to compare. That would be a little harder for you to see on your own. I'll bring that out to you next week. Okay? If they want to hear the song when you're done. Roger found the song. <laughs> if you want to hear it, stay tuned. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you find us faithful because of the shed blood of your son, because we have come into a relationship with you through the one who says, I am the door. And we know that Yeshua Jesus is the only way to the Father, and in him is forgiveness of sin forever and is comfort, and is rest. We know it's nothing that we earn, nothing that we do. We don't even keep it. You keep us. For that we are so thankful. But we also see it behooves us to be careful that we not stumble and fall, that we not be filled with our own pride, that we not think that we've arrived or anything else, Lord. Help us to see clearly where we're beginning to, to sin, whether it be accidental or whether it even be a rebelliousness that comes up in us. Hold us close to you, Lord, and may we see and understand the right way and be quick at the correction that we not have to learn a hard lesson, that we turn easily at any of your correction, that we might be more conformed to your image, more pleasing unto you, and that we might be setting an example of godliness to those around us, that they might be drawn to you also, Lord, by the light in us. Thank you for this privilege to serve you, and we know it's your spirit in, it, in us that does it because we uh, in ourselves could not. So we thank you, and we praise you, and we give you all the glory. It's yours, not ours, and we say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, our Father and Savior, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen.